Hey, everybody. I am Paul, and you are on the live Q&A with me. I hope that it's working. I can't really tell if it's working, so I'm just going to start and hope that everybody is listening. And I have, I don't know, 30 or 40 questions, and I've got about an hour, so I'm going to do my best to get through all of them. Some people asked, I don't know, 10 or 12 questions. I'm probably going to try to only answer one of each question. And yeah, let's uh, get started. I've got my questions on the left side of my, my of my screen because this is my good side. So just, just for everybody out there. First question is from Justin. When did you get your first tattoo? Which one is it? And what's the story behind it? Uh, my first tattoo is a turnip, and it was actually the first logo for my company, which was called Turnip Core in the 90s, before it was called 230, before it was called PJRVS. And I drew it myself, and I like it quite a bit. Um, most of the questions are businessy, but Justin, I think, asked a, a fun tattoo question. Chris asks, college for design, yay or nay? Well, Chris, I don't know, because I didn't go to college for design. I can only speak to what I do know, and that's that I taught myself. And I think the the best thing to do is to figure out the way that you learn and do that. So if you learn best in college, go to college. If you learn best online, there's so many great courses that you can do online. If you learn best by kind of taking the work and dissecting it and doing it for yourself, that's the way I, that's the way I do it. But uh, yeah, so I think that's um, the way that you learn is the best way to do it. Um, next, uh, Vitaly. How and why you decided to start writing your own books? Well, how I started writing my own books was by writing them. <laughs> uh, I realized that I wanted to write a book, so I started writing a chapter, and then another chapter, and then another chapter, and then at the end I had enough to put it in a book. Why I started writing was because I felt like I had something to say. I felt like I wanted to say a few things. The first book was a vegan cookbook. So I wanted to say a few things about veganism and about good vegan food and not be very judgy about it. So I did a cookbook. The next books were kind of businessy, and I felt like I'd been doing business for quite a while when I started writing. I felt like I had a voice and something interesting to say. I, I hope it's interesting. So that's kind of why I started writing. A uh, question from Abigail. Are you naturally comfortable sharing your personality online? If not, how do you develop that ability? I feel like I have an awkwardness barrier that keeps me from being myself, even after working at this for years. So I'm not comfortable sharing myself online. I'm not comfortable doing things like these video calls. I still do them, and I'm trying to grow and learn as I do them. And I think the, the biggest thing is that I don't really share all of myself or all of my personality online. I just share what I'm comfortable with. So a lot of that has to do with business and freelancing and creativity. And that's the kind of stuff that I feel comfortable sharing. Um, I also feel comfortable sharing. I realize that I'm in my living room, not my office, because my chair got fixed and they used a chemical and I don't want my rat Ari to get into it. So as you can see, there's a, a beautiful, disgustingly ugly chandelier here, and it's not mine. It was left here. Same with this TV right here. That's not ours. It was just left here when we moved in. And the chandelier is the ugliest thing I've ever seen, so I wanted to keep it. But these are things that I typically don't share, and I feel comfortable sharing stuff about, back to the question, I feel comfortable sharing about business and a few other things like pet rats or about hiking and that sort of thing. So I think if you take baby steps sharing just little pieces about what you feel comfortable with, then you can kind of overcome that awkwardness barrier because I'm pretty introverted and I'm not really good interacting with, pe with people and I still kind of push forward through it. I'm actually just going to take a drink of water. You like my mason jar? Uh, question from Liz. I would love to know a bit more about the process of submitting your writing to big publications you've appeared in. Did you contact them directly? Did you pitch a specific angle? Or did you submit the story in full? So I'm actually writing an article about this. It should be on my mailing list within about three weeks. So I have pitched to every single entrepreneurial and freelance and tech 
publication that there is, and I've heard all of like diddly squat back from them. But the way that I get to write for these people is by the connections that I've made and the people that I know. And that seems to be the way that it works is if, say, I want to write for Huffington Post, I have emailed them before and I've heard diddly squat back. But a friend of mine that I know writes for them and he said that he would gladly introduce me to one of the editors. Thank you very much, Sean. And that's how I got to write for them. So I think a lot of it comes down to, for that kind of being able to share your writing with um, publications and that, a lot of it comes down to the connections that you make and the people that you talk to. So when I first started wanting to write for them, I started to look, okay, do I know anybody that writes for them? Can I follow some of the editors on Twitter and start interacting with them? Can I follow some of the writers and the contributors on Twitter and start interacting with them? Not because I wanted to get something out of it, but just because they were doing something that I wanted to do, so I wanted to learn how they did it, and I wanted to just make connections with people. And a lot of it comes down to that. It's all about who you know and the connections that you make. So, yeah, that's pretty much how that works. And like I said, the article will be out um, on my newsletter probably within the month. Bobby asks, you mentioned that you put attribution at the bottom of all the websites you work on. How do you ask for this? Are people generally cool with it? If they're not, do you take it as a sign of what the relationship will be like? I think it's great and would love to do this as well, but I see cases where clients wouldn't be comfortable with it. Yeah, so how do I ask for it? I just say, can I put a link to my website at the bottom saying website designed and programmed by PJRVS or Paul Jarvis or whatever I'm calling my company. Um, and yeah, it doesn't always work. Like if I'm doing a project for like Yahoo or Mercedes-Benz, then I'm not going to ask them to put my name on the bottom of the website because that, that wouldn't happen. So I think you have to be smart about it. But because most of my clients are single person creative entrepreneurs that they're, they're down to share that kind of thing, they're down to promote their team, that nobody really has a problem with it. If they don't want it on it, I don't take it as a sign of anything other than the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't jive with their business. If somebody wanted me to put their name on my website, I wouldn't, and I don't think there's any problem with that. But I think it, it's more just kind of sussing out the type of client they are, the type of website they want, and if they would be comfortable doing it. Obviously, I think it's a really good way to drive sales. That's kind of how I've done a lot of sales, and there's a couple questions about web design coming up as well. But yeah, so suss out the relationship. Get to know the person, listen to what they have to say, and that sort of thing. Hope that helps. Uh, question from Wazen. I hope I'm saying your name right, and I apologize if I'm not. How to be confident in your work and not try to compare yourself to others or even care what others think? Um, so I think you can be both confident and not confident in yourself and your work at the same time. Um, I know I am. I Every time I publish an article, I think like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, this might suck. People might hate me for it. And obviously sometimes I do get hate mail for it. And then I kind of joke about it on Twitter when I do, which is kind of funny. But the other thing is comparing yourself to others. It sucks. I just recorded a podcast with my podcasting buddy, Jason um, Surfer App, about comparison, and that should be out in a few weeks. Our podcast is called Invisible Office Hours. It's on iTunes, but <laughs> shameless plug. Um, trying to compare, yeah, trying not to compare yourself to others is a tough thing, so I think it's something we all do, but I don't think that comparison really serves any purpose other than to make ourselves feel bad most of the time, so I think it's better to focus and be present on the work that you're doing and what you're putting out there. And obviously, you're going to think about it sometimes, but try not to let that guide any action. Try to let that exist separate from the action that you take. And I think that's the best way to do it. Um, caring what others think, I think that's a tough one. I realize I should be touching my keyboard, not on my computer. So my computer's on a stand, and I see it moves. It looks like there's an earthquake. Woo! Um, yeah, I digress. Uh, caring what other people think is a tough one. I say I don't care all the time, and a lot of times I don't, but then sometimes I'll get a nasty email from somebody, or somebody will threaten to come to my house and kick my ass, and then I'll be like, I kind of care about that, and I kind of think that person was a jerk. So, it's tough. I don't know. I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, question from Sarah. 
how crucial is it to fit ne neatly into a niche when launching a blog? I'm a multi-passionate entrepreneur who blogs frequently for others, but has a hard time doing it for myself. Mainly, I feel there's no direction, lots of ideas, lot no cohesion. It's severely stunting the growth of my blog and audience slash community I'm building. So this is something that I struggle with too, right? Because I care and like to talk about lots of things, like talk about web design and freelancing and writing and sometimes music and a lot of times rats. And I think a lot of it comes down to the goal and the purpose and your specific why for your blog. So you can write about whatever topic you want, but as long as you relate it back to your intention and goal for the site, I think it's fine. Like, I've write, I don't even know what I write about. I write about whatever I feel like you guys want to read and what I want to write, and it kind of relates to whatever it relates to, but it all ties back to the intentions that I have with the writing that I share with people. So I think, um, yeah, intentions and your why are more important than the very specific things that you're going to be writing about. You don't need to put yourself in a box. So, yeah. So a bunch of people ask this question. Um, Carolyn, Jake, and a few others. Um, just getting started as freelance web designers. The business side is mysterious and terrifying. If you could travel back in time and give yourself some books on marketing business, uh, what would they be? I realize this is the lamest excuse for a time machine ever. So if I had a time machine, I would go back in time and give myself a high five. But I wouldn't because the time paradoxes that would then occur and it could completely destroy the world. So I wouldn't, even if I had a time machine, I wouldn't use it. But to your question, uh, the books that I would recommend, um, anything by Chris Brogan for marketing and business, he is an amazing writer and an amazing human being. And he writes... Uh, Freaks that in Freaks will inherit inherit the earth is his latest book, my favorite book. I told him it it it's like he wrote that book specifically for me, but it's really really good. He probably wrote it specifically for you as well. Um, as far as like design and business books, Design is a Job by Mike from Mule Design is a good book. Um, I don't know. There's a book by uh, Ryan Holiday called Trust Me I'm Lying, which is really good talking about kind of marketing and sales and the, the fun things that he did early on. Um, yeah, so those are some of the books that I'd recommend. And no, say no to time machines. Lucas asked, what, or sorry, would you give some advice to someone who's preparing to go vegan? First of all, that's awesome. I'm vegan and I love being vegan. But the advice that I would give to somebody is to take baby steps like eat one vegan meal and have that as the thing that you do and then try to eat a few vegan meals a week and then try to eat a vegan meal a day and that sort of thing. And I think it's important, especially when you're starting out with something new, is to not beat yourself up when it doesn't work out. So if you accidentally eat meat or you eat dairy or just because you feel like it for one day and you're still kind of working towards that, who cares? Just kind of keep moving forward. It doesn't matter if you take a step back, take two steps forward next time. So that's about, that's probably what I would do for, and you could also get my book, which is free, um, Eat Awesome, and it's on my website, pjrvs.com slash EA, uh, and the book is Pay What You Want, so you can pay nothing and get it, and you have my permission to get it for free. Holy smokes, so there's a lot more questions coming in, and I would try my best to get to them um, next question. Where was I? Oh my goodness, there's a lot of questions. This is pretty cool though. Uh, Vova asked, how do you keep yourself motivated when it seems that society and even close people to you want you to go with the safe, boring job where you can get laid off anytime? I think you answered your own, your own question. There is no safe job. There is no job that guarantees you a future. So if you want to do something on your own, do it. If you want to work for somebody else, that's fine too. Like, I think when for me, when I was starting out, I was in university in a, a decent program for computer science, and I decided that it was what the dream that other people had for me. It wasn't the dream that I had for myself. And one day I was just like, fuck it, I'm done. And I was lucky because at the time, uh, an agency in Toronto offered me a job to be a web designer because I had been doing websites on the side sort of thing. So I went into the office of my um, 
uh, the head of the Department of Computer Science at U of T and just told him, like, sorry, dude, I'm going to... I probably didn't call him dude. Actually, I might have. But I was like, dude, I'm sorry. I am going to be dropping out of the program. It's a great program. It's just not for me. And he was like, you're going to be sorry. And I'm like, cool, that's fine. And I fully expected to be back in school, like back probably at the same school within a year or two. But it didn't work out that way, obviously. That was... I don't know, like 16, 17 years ago. So I think you can make your own decisions. Stop listening to other people if they're giving you advice you don't like. I don't know. I, I only listen to what I want to listen to, and sometimes it's incredibly stupid, and sometimes it's incredibly smart. Uh, Tom asks, why do you not show the date when you publish an article on your website? I like these ones. These are easy. So I don't have a date because I feel like I wouldn't publish an article on my site if it wasn't continually relevant. So if somebody saw an article that I wrote two years ago and it had a date from 2012, they might think, meh, that was from years ago. I don't even care anymore. The, the web is a different place. So I don't put dates on because I want my content to be evergreen and to be thought of as evergreen. And obviously, it gets syndicated in a lot of places. Those The places where my writing goes after it lives on my site all have dates. But when I can control it, I would rather not have um, dates just because I feel like it's either going to be relevant forever or if it's not, I'll take it down or if it's not, I'm not going to publish it anyways. <sighs> Esme asks, hi Esme. Uh, from what I know about your methods, you seem to be very engaged in things like A-B testing, analyzing metrics and so forth. At the same time, I know you definitely focus on creation and doing the work. Doing the work is in capital letters. I like that. Uh, what are some of the most important analyses that I slash your Hangout viewers could try implementing if they haven't already? So, yeah, I care some about metrics and testing, and some I just say fuck it and just do what I want and what I think will benefit them. Will will let my art benefit itself the most from. So for A-B testing, there's things that you can get a plugin for WordPress that lets you run A-B testing. You can use things like Unbounce uh, for landing pages. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. They're just a cool company, and they let you A-B test. So the things you could be A-B testing for could be anything, basically. If you have a theory that one thing on your site could work better than another thing, then that's what you would test. Say it's for a newsletter. Um, maybe you want to test the text that goes kind of above the sign-up form. So the A test would be the one version of text, the B test would be another version of text, or if you want to test button color for the sign-up field, or if you want to test, I don't know, the, the text that goes on the button, if you want to see if the word free actually does make a difference, then that's what you would test. As far as metrics go, yeah, I kind of care about them and I kind of don't. So the metrics that I care about are not the number of people who visit my site or visit pages, but <clears throat> excuse me, looking at trends. So if I see that one article is performing far better than any other article on my site, then I think, hmm, maybe that's something I can write about more. Maybe that can turn into a book. Or maybe this is what my audience is interested in, so I'm kind of going to go in that direction sort of thing. So I kind of look more at the trends and the, the, the numbers and the individual stuff. And yeah, at, it's all about doing the work in capital letters. I really like that. Um, Helena asks, I want to know how you work with other designers when working on a website. That's easy. I don't work with other designers. I just If somebody's hired me to do the website, then I'm the web designer. And I don't, I don't work with other people, so I don't have a team or anything. It's just myself. So yeah, that's an easy, <laughs> that's an easy question to answer. Um, Elias asks, do you see the value in sticking with something beyond the sucky point if you sense there's a lesson to be learned? Not a life lesson, but maybe an insight into leadership or your own threshold for quitting. Not unless you're into giving yourself unnecessary pain, dude. Like, if you've already stuck with something to the point where you want to change it, then change it. Like, you've already learned that you want to change it, so why stick it out any further? Like, I'm a... I'm a big fan of if something's not working, then you got to try something different. You can't just keep trying that same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. So huh, I just I see a question from one of my clients, uh, Karen, that just popped up onto my screen. What does your yoga practice look like these days? 
Um, my my Hatha practice looks like absolutely nothing right now. I'm spending all my time kind of hiking. I haven't really done much physical yoga in a long time. Uh, what I do do is more um, mind work, I guess, where I, I sit and meditate or I just sit. And I don't really like the word meditate. It makes people think of like hippie-ish type things. But like I sit with my eyes closed with no stimulation and try not to judge my thoughts for however long I do, maybe five to ten minutes in the morning. That's kind of what my yoga practice looks like right now. I should actually uh, get back into get back into a bit of a Hatha practice, like a physical flow practice. Um, oh, I can click. I forgot. I can do this. Selecting the question. Done. You guys can't see this. I'm just talking to myself at this point. Next question. JT, for those who want to venture out uh, out into something else, be it getting more into writing or heck, switching careers. Heck, switching careers from a nine to five job into self employment. What do you think it is that holds people back? Um, I don't know. Whatever's holding you back is holding you back. Uh, my answer is probably that it's different for everybody. I've never really had a nine to five job, so I don't know. I went from, well, I guess I kind of did. I worked for an agency for about a year, but um, yeah, I kind of fell into freelancing without um really planning to do it. So I don't I don't know. Sorry, dude. Question from Rob. My question is freelancing for 15 plus years is a huge accomplish accomplishment. That's not a question, but I appreciate it. Now your question is what is your advice for how to build a freelance business for the long haul? So Rob, um thing that I do is try to make my clients so happy that they tell other people about me and about the work that I do. Um so uh, basically I do what I say I'm going to do for every project and I hear from a lot of clients and from a lot of people that work with web designers that every web designer they've worked with or most of the web designers that they've worked with um, are shit at communication and suck at giving them deliverables when they said they would. All I've ever done is do that. If I say I'm going to give you a mock-up on Tuesday, you're getting that mock-up on Tuesday probably Monday at some point because I always like to be a bit early on stuff. So that's really my biggest advice is if you're always making your clients so happy that they're telling other people, then you're, you're basically building a client list and a sales force at the same time, which is pretty rad. Uh, another question about web design from John. How do you sell web design? After all, you need clients. Where do yours come from? Mine come from people, What a, like I was just saying, they come from people that have heard about me from other people or relating it way back to the question at the beginning, they see a link to my website from another person's website that I've designed. So obviously when I do sites for people like Daniela Port, when I used to do her website, that link generated a lot of business because people knew who she was. She's pretty popular for good reason and they would see her website and see that I designed it and then they would go to my portfolio and see, okay, well he designs a lot of websites for people kind of that work in a similar industry as Danielle. So he's that guy that works in that industry. So a lot of times because I focused on a specific niche like creative entrepreneurs that are kind of building like an online businesses or empires that I become known as the guy who does those kind of websites and then it becomes easier because my name gets known in the industry that I work in that I'm the guy who does these type of websites so people come to me for this. So that's really how I get clients. Um, my mom stopped referring clients to me a long time ago. Sorry, mom. <laughs> she never referred any clients to me. Um, Katie asks, on productivity, what does a typical day look like for you? Do you have any writing rituals to warm you up for bigger tasks? Um, I don't have typical days. So some days I might be doing web design. Some days I might be doing writing for myself. Some days I might be writing books. Some days I might be writing for publications. Some days I might be doing Q&As like this. There's no typical day. Um, I don't have any rituals for warming up for bigger tasks. I find that, and this is just me obviously, I find that the easiest way to do a task is to jump into it and just start doing it. Like if I have a book to write, then I'm focusing on getting that next paragraph done or the next chapter done. I don't really I don't really warm up for anything other than like a bit of maybe centering at the beginning of the day where I sit and uh, let my thoughts run rampant while I'm not judging them. Yeah. Um, I have a drink of water. Roger asks, hi Roger, 
Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur even though you are a freelancer and trading time for money? Um, well, that's actually not true. I sell products. I've been the founder of a few startups. I'm on the board of directors for a few startups. So I actually don't call myself an entrepreneur. I call myself, I guess, more of a gentleman of adventure, a web designer, and a writer. So, yeah, I guess I could be an entrepreneur, or I could call myself that because I do sell products like books and courses and all that kind of stuff, but I don't call myself... Labels are for jars, so I don't really call myself anything other than silly things like Gentleman of Adventure, which doesn't really mean anything. But Chris Brogan called me that one time, and I thought it was apt, so I took it. And now I owe him a quarter every time I use it. So, Chris, you have like 50 cents coming your way. Uh, Jocelyn asks, my question is about the start of immense new projects. Any particular method for approaching... Do you break it into chunks? Dive in. Are you more of a planner or a pantser or something else? What is a pantser? You need to email me and tell me what a pantser is. I have no idea what a pantser is, but I'm, I guess, a bit of a planner. So the way that it works with a big project, whether it's a web design project or whether it is a book, is you got to... And you answered, you, you answered your own question, Jocelyn. You're so smart. My answer is that you... Bre I break it up into small chunks. So if I'm writing a book, I start with a paragraph or a chapter. If I'm doing a web design project, then I know every single little task that needs to happen. And so I focus on, okay, this is task one, get it done. This is task two, get it done. I talk a lot with my hands when I'm on video, but in person I don't really do that. I don't know why. It's interesting. Somebody can uh, psychoanalyze that, I guess. Mm, next. Kevin asks from Buffer. I love Buffer. Uh, my question, what are your favorite newsletters and blogs to read? I'm sure the list is long, and it is. Just curious what some of your top picks are. So some of the people that I really like reading lately are um, Justin Jackson. His site is the theme that I designed. And no, you can't have it because I don't sell themes anymore. Uh, but his writing is really good. Um, Greg Ciotti writes uh, Sparing Mind. He also writes for Help Scout. He is like a mad scientist of data and psychology and a master storyteller, kind of all rolled into one. So really love his writing. Uh, Jason Sadler, or Jason Surfer app, is another writer I really like. His book, Creativity for Sale, is one of my favorite books this year, along with uh, The Freaks book by Chris Brogan. So Jason's a great writer. He's also the co-host of the podcast that I have, Invisible Office Hours, and just an all-around good guy. And he's actually going vegan with his uh, girlfriend for a few weeks. So ever all the vegans can cheer for, for them to... Uh, to have a good time being vegan for a few weeks. Uh, another author I really like is Lauren Bacon. She is a brilliant writer, and I've worked with her before in the past. She's hired me when she used to work for, or when she owned a web design company, and they had me do some, some work on contract. I've known her forever, and her writing is just phenomenal. She kind of touches on a lot of things that I do, but I think in a better way. She's a better writer than I am, where it's like talking about empathy and the human side of work and dealing with people and she's really good at finding examples and that sort of thing and weaving in stories. She also has a free ebook on her site which is really good and I suggest, I think you get it if you sign up for her newsletter so do that, please. Um, I think those are the bloggers and the newsletters that I've been reading lately. Um, all this, not to brown nose, but Kevin, I really like Buffer, and I'm on the Buffer mailing list too, and I know that's your mailing list, but I really like it, and I read it. And I also use the Buffer, I think it's called Daily app on my phone, which is pretty cool. Uh, so you have a follow-up question, which I'll answer, even though I said I wasn't going to answer two from the same person, is what are the name of your pet rats? Um, Ari and Ona. Unfortunately, Ona passed away two weeks ago, which really, really fucking sucked, but Ari is still here, and sh that's why I'm in this room and not my office, because of the chair getting sprayed with some chemicals to make it not squeak. So, yeah, um, we may be getting some more rats. We're not sure, and we'd be getting them from the SPCA because adopting is is adopting is awesome. But we're not 100% sure yet. We'll we'll get them if it seems like because rats are super social. If it looks like she kind of needs a little buddy, then we'll get her a little buddy or two. Um, Nicole asks, "How are we doing for time? We're holy smokes, we're halfway through. I hope I'm not going too fast or too slow for people." Um, Let's take one from the stream on the side from Dan. 
he asks, what are the most helpful things you've done to grow your newsletter um, and audience? Um, what have I done to grow my audience? I think sharing. I share articles. I think people like the consistency of my newsletter. And since it's called the Sunday Dispatches, I better damn well send an email every Sunday. So I think the fact that I write consistently, I write 52 times a year without exception, a new article that I send out. And I think people like that. They come to expect that Sunday dispatch, hopefully. Um, if they don't, I guess they unsubscribe, and that's fine too. So, yeah, and I think just trying to be valuable to people. Like, I would rather people that don't know me sign up for my mailing list first, kind of get a feel for the way that I write, what I like to write about. And then if they want to buy one of my books, then they're kind of qualified that they like me or like my writing first. So I think being valuable and offering, as I call content marketing, I call it being valuable, but I think that's really all it is, is that I try to be as valuable as I can to the people that I want to serve. And me doing that for them, they in turn buy my books or hire me for consults or web design or that sort of thing. And it's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship. It's not like a, a non-mutually beneficial relationship. Um, yeah. Oh, did I? I think I answered that. I gotta get good at this Google thing. It's uh, kind of weird. So, next question from Nicole. Uh, I like these questions. They're kind of some are super specific and some are a bit more thinky, which is good. Um, Nicole asks, I am curious about what software CMS you use to build your clients' websites. What do you specifically like about your, what you're currently using? Um, so I use WordPress for all my clients' websites just because it's easy to use for both myself because I build custom themes from scratch and it's also easy for them to use because I am i don't really have maintenance packages with my clients. I want to empower them to be able to update the site however they want, when they want and WordPress lets them do that if they want to add new content, blog posts, change the menu, update photos. They don't need to contact me, they can just get it done so they don't have to pay more money for my time or somebody else's time that's a nerd to do it. For myself I use Pico CMS because I am a nerd and it's a flat file CMS. I write in Markdown anyways and it uses Markdown for the flat file delivery. It's also faster because it doesn't have a database so if I have 300 concurrent users on my site my server's not going to throw up on me which happened a few times before, before I upgraded my server when something I wrote got popular or something like that and my site was in WordPress so I switched over to Pico just because it's easier and I like it and the nerd in me likes to muck around with uh, new CMSs. That was the next question too for Marcus. So Marcus, I answered your question while I was answering Nicole's question. Hope that's good. Question from Julie. I'm hoping there will be more questions addressed about pulling all the how-tos of that route together. I keep a, new, a newsletter and running email list smoothing, running smoothly while making art. So I don't really get that. But I think what you're trying to ask is how to keep running the business and marketing side of things while you're making art. And I think what you need to do is kind of have the, my, I think my, the last post was about wearing, oh no, the last post was about quitting. Two posts ago I wrote about wearing lots of hats if you work for yourself. So one hat is you're making art and then at some point during the day or during the week you have to make time to do the business side of things, whether it's accounting or marketing or creating content that you share with your audience through newsletters and that sort of thing. Both are important and I think a lot of times people get kind of caught in one school so the marketers are all like rah rah marketing, the, the artists are all like rah rah fuck sales and marketing, I'm just gonna make art. And I think there's that middle ground that is where I talk a lot about where yeah you gotta be making your art but yeah you've also gotta be telling people about it. So I think you've gotta yeah get two hats and wear two hats at different times of the day or of the week. Yeah. Um, it's weird because, right, there's no feedback here, so it's just me talking, and uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. Question from Michelle. What are your mandatories for you and your clients to keep projects on task, on schedule, and on budget? It seems our industry has to allow room for indecisiveness. Personal things come up, but we all need to be efficient. So 
I don't think there's room for indecisiveness. I think I wouldn't work with somebody if they were indecisive because if I showed them a mock-up, they'd be like, eh, I don't know. If I showed them a logo, they'd be like, eh, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't work with that person. So the way that I like to keep on task and schedule and budget is to be so clear before there's money on the line. So if we're talking about the deliverables, then these are the deliverables. If it's not on this list, I'm not doing it for that price that we set out sort of thing. And then the schedule is really, I have, because I book so many months in advance, I tell clients, like, this is your eight-week window. I'm 100% going to get you everything you need in that time. Anytime there's a delay, it's like I've been doing this for, I've been doing websites for 20 years, and every time there's a delay, it's because of the client, typically content. So I try to get them to do as much homework before a project starts, so they don't have as much to do while the project's running. So we can just move smoothly from A to B. And yeah, if they ask for stuff that isn't in the scope, I tell them, I will gladly do this for you. It costs $500 or it costs X number of dollars. And then you're just really setting a precedent that you're not just a pushover. He's just going to say, yes, sir, I'm going to do that work, sir. Or yes, ma'am, I'm going to do that work, ma'am. Yeah, that's um, how I do it. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty much a stickler for the type of people and for the specific people I work with. I only like to work with people where I think that the project is going to go well and it seems kind of like, oh, well, you're in a position where you can do that. It's like, no, I wasn't doing, I was doing that before I was in a position to do that because I knew that if I started to work with somebody where my gut feeling is like, oh, this person's going to suck to work with or if I felt like they were super indecisive or they didn't get back to me for weeks at a time, those kind of projects, if I did take them on and I did a few times, they were the worst projects ever and they weren't worth my time or to get paid for. I should have my rat Ari like dance across the screen while I'm drinking water or something. Um, Miranda asks, if someone contacts you for a web design project and you completely love what they're doing and believe they can succeed, but they have concerns about money, how do you handle that? Do you say something to convince them otherwise, or do you let them be until they've worked through their money blocks? Yeah, I love to help people, but I also run a business. So if somebody can't afford to pay my rate, then I don't work with them. I don't. I will definitely tell them I'm not going anywhere. Like I've been doing this for so long. When they're ready, I'm always here. And I get people that have talked to me four years ago come back to me and say, "Hey, Paul, I'm ready." And that's awesome. And if I try to convince somebody that it's worth the money that they don't have to spend on the project, I would feel like a bad human being. So I don't, I don't do that. But then if they have a budget, like I'm a single, I'm a one man show. So I understand that people have budgets. So if somebody comes to me and says, Hey Paul, I need a website and they can't afford what I charge, then I suggest some other people that I think do good work, but my charge slightly less or fit into their budget. So I try to help people. Like even if I can't work with them, like I'm going to say no if like I don't really, I'm never going, like I, I don't haggle for my work. If somebody wants a deal, then they can go somewhere else, some other web designer for a deal. Like my rates are my rates and I'm pretty strict about that and I think you kind of have to be. Like it's easy to just be a pushover with that kind of stuff and you shouldn't be because it always ends in badness. Question from Jelly, and I know you asked about 15 questions. I'm going to answer one because <laughs> there was a lot of questions. What tactics and tools do you use to sell your products, and what would be the first step if you're down on sales? Um, <clears throat> the t I don't have any tactics for selling. I basically tell my audience about um, what I've got going on, and I involve them in the process. If I'm writing a book, then I'm sharing excerpts with my mailing list. I might share drawings from it. I might share what I'm going through in the process. So I'm kind of building up the book without being super pushy about it before it comes out. And then when it does come out, people are like, oh, I remember reading about that, or oh, I've been waiting for that. And that's obviously the best case scenario. And then when I launch it, I don't really have any tactics or tools. My tool is my mailing list, right? Like, the, the money's in the mailing list, as every fucking marketer says, and I agree with that. So 
I use I've used my mailing list for every book or product launch I've ever done and it served me well and I just make sure that when I'm not selling a book or a product which is only usually once a year anyways or twice a year those other 50 weeks because I send out emails weekly I'm I'm giving value to the people of my audience so they appreciate that and then when I do have something they're more likely to buy it I don't expect them to but if they feel like I give them the value then hey then let's uh, <laughs> buy my book I guess uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Neil asked, hey Paul, hey Neil, what is your strategy regarding your archived articles? Do you have a set schedule, for example, share again after two weeks and six weeks? Um, no, I don't. I could. I would be a better content marketer, whatever it's called, if I did that, but I don't. So the only thing that I do, and I think this works really well for me, I don't know if it would work for anybody else, but it works for me, is that I have an ad account with um, Twitter, ads.twitter.com. You don't even need to spend money, but that lets you schedule tweets. You can also use Buffer to schedule tweets. I'm not affiliated with Buffer. I just like it. So I send out a schedule tweet at 2 a.m. my time every day, and I just basically I set up it up for the whole month, and then I just kind of pick the articles that jump out at me that I've written, and I try to find a line from the article that relates to their article that I haven't tweeted before. That's, that's what I do. I know it could be a lot better, but that's what I have time for. Um, Jake asks, have you and Jason considered having guests on your podcast? Hints about who? Podcast, shameless, shameless plug. Invisible Office Hours is a podcast that I host with uh, Jason Surfer app. Uh, it's at invisibleofficehours.com or look it up. I was going to say Google it on iTunes. Use iTunes search, which is in no way affiliated with Google, to find it. Um, no, we're not going to have guests. I haven't talked to Jason about this, but every other podcast, or not every other podcast, a lot of podcasts have guests, and that's great for them. We kind of wanted to do something different, and we obviously, if you listen to them, have a lot to talk about, just the two of us. So... Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll prove myself wrong. Maybe we'll Jason, Maybe Jason will call me after this and yell at me about having guests. That won't happen. Um, but yeah, there won't there's not gonna be any guests. <clears throat> um, Ian asks, which of your tattoos do people most often ask you about or comment on? Uh, alternately, which do you like the most or are most proud of? So it's funny. People stop me all the time because obviously, like, I'm covered in tattoos on my legs and arms and my chest and back and everything. So, so they don't have any neck tattoos. My wife doesn't like neck tattoos, and I like my wife, so I don't have any tattoos there. But um, a lot of people comment on depends. Usually, when I'm paying for something, people see my hands, so they see the um, the symbols on my hands, which are from K paintings. Uh, and pictograms from the southwest of the states where I like to spend a lot of time and for me they're like the original logos like those are the first or sorry icons it's like the first icon designers painted them on walls and because I'm a designer I really like those um, but a lot of people yeah comment on, on my hand tattoos or I have a tattoo of an octopus on my right leg which I'm not um, flexible enough to show you and that people comment on because it's very colorful and uh, yeah, people ask me about all my tattoos all the time. A lot of them don't even mean anything. A lot of them are just art because I'm an artist and I like art. Um, Joe asked, um, I'm considering Shopify as a platform, but wondering if you have any opinion on it as an all-in-one. I don't, I don't use Shopify. I know people that do, so Joe, if you're thinking about Shopify, I can refer you to four amazing Shopify developers and themers. I can't answer that because I don't know. Um, mostly for digital products and MailChimp integration. Um, for myself, I just use WordPress or Pico for the content management system, and then I use um, Gumroad to sell my products because they're all digital. Gumroad is just super easy, so I just use that. But Shopify, it seems like it's a great platform. I just don't know. So that's it. Those are all the questions that people asked beforehand. Now I am going to jump over to the right side of my screen and see if there's any ones that I didn't answer to, uh, to, uh, to go through here. So I'm going to select this question from Lilith. Hi, Paul. How do you handle customer service when you launch books? Do you have to hire outside help or are you able to handle it yourself? 
thankfully there isn't any customer service. <laughs> like, I people don't really. I think I've maybe had one or two returns because somebody said they accident for the good creative lunch. Somebody said they accidentally bought it, to which I call bullshit. Right? Like, how do you accidentally enter in your credit card number and your name and then hit buy? There's too many steps for that to be an accident. You just wanted my book for free, but I still gave them a refund. So. Luckily for books, there's not much customer service. A lot of my books I've launched just on Amazon, so if they want to return them, they go through Amazon. And a lot of times, because you have seven days to return a Kindle book, a lot of people scam the system, so they'll buy the book on Kindle, read it in six days, return it, and then I don't get any money, which, what are you going to do? I don't really care. So, but I don't need to, I don't need to, thankfully I don't need to deal with it. So, but an aside to that is, the reason I don't sell WordPress themes anymore is because of the amount of support they had. So I was selling WordPress themes for 20 bucks, but I was getting sometimes two or three emails which were taking me 30, 40 minutes to reply to for each sale, and that's not worth that's not worth $20 to me, and I'm not going to charge like $500 for a WordPress theme that I built that everybody can buy. So I like books because they require no customer service. I don't have any outside help for that. Hope that answers your question. Um, answered that one. Answered that one. So I'm just gonna go through the list here. Um, <laughs> here's a good one. How do you fire a client with grace? From Jake. Well, Jake, I, you're assuming grace, and most of the time that's true. Sometimes it's not. I've actually, unfortunately, had one or two um, not so happy interactions but so the way that you hire people or you fire people with grace the way that I've done it is basically just being honest with them and leveling with them as a human being so if I'm working with a person and I thought at the beginning and they thought too that it was going to be a project where we would both be able to communicate well and we were both on the same page with what we wanted to deliver because I'm very opinionated about what I do. I obviously collaborate with clients, but I have ideas about things that I'm, I, I stick to. So if it's not working out, then I just tell them, like, look, hey, some, I'm not the right designer for you. Somebody else out there probably is. I will even help you find that next designer, but it's not me. And whatever we agreed upon in the contract is the kill fee that's happening right now and we're both going to go our separate ways and I'm, I'm actually still friends with some people that we've started working together and we've had to call it quits because of the project because we just weren't on the same page so being honest and being a real person instead of just kind of and I think a lot of times um, with nerds that do like web design and I say nerd lovingly because I'm a nerd um, nerds that do like designer development, if they're having a problem with a client or they're having a problem with a project, then they just kind of disappear or they become unresponsive and that is the worst possible thing you can do because you're just going to piss the other person off and the likelihood of there being a confrontation is going to multiply. So if you level with somebody, if you're not digging it, then you're not digging it. Tell them, be nice, be a person, they're a person too. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, here's one. Hey, dude, how about an easy one? What's your ideal client? Oh, I love, I love good clients. Um, my ideal client could basically be anybody, so it doesn't need to specifically be somebody that does X. So what I'm looking for in a, what I'm looking for in a client is they know their shit. So whatever they do, whatever they create, whatever they produce they know they are like the top dog uh, for what they do and they really get the value that they provide to their audience they're just not sure how to do it online or they're just not sure about the marketing component of it or they're just not sure about how mailing lists work or how to best set up or format their website for their audience to get whatever it is that they sell so yeah my ideal client knows their stuff and then they come to me because I know my stuff and then there's this beautiful magical collaboration thing that happens when I get what I need from them because they know what they do they get what they need from me because I know what I do and we make magic and it's, it's awesome I, I'm lucky that I have a lot of really good clients uh, that was an easy one 
Um, next. Of one who is looking to make a name for themselves just out of college, does it make sense to write a book for free? Does it devalue the product? I'm going to take a drink while I think. Um, so Ellie asked that. Ellie, to be honest, I don't know what you, how much you would know about anything coming right out of college. Like obviously you know what you studied, but if you don't have any, and I guess it depends, if you're writing a book about college, then that's probably the best time to write a book about it. If you're writing about your industry, you kind of got to work in it first. And I kind of a hard ass on that, and I really think that people need to pay their dues. And it's unpopular. I'm the unpopular guy saying you've got to do a lot of work to get somewhere, whereas a lot of other people have more popular ideas where just be rich like me or that sort of thing. So I don't know. If you're going to write a book, I'm not going to stop you. I think it's a good idea for anybody to write a book that wants to, but I don't know what value you're going to be able to provide to people if you've just finished school. So maybe it's time to work for a bit, even working for yourself for a bit, learning a bit about the audience that you're trying to hit with the book, maybe researching that audience, maybe talking to that audience, that's a good thing. Um, but if you're free versus paid, I don't know, it's a like raging debate like religion or politics, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to select that and mark that as done, even though I did a really shitty job answering it. Um, a couple people asked me questions that weren't questions. Uh, let me get to a question here. Um, Elias said, my question is, oh no, sorry, I answered that one already. I thought I didn't, but I did. Um, thanks for doing this, that's great. Thanks, Roger. Um, let me try to see, otherwise I'm just going to uh, wrap up. But Oh no, here's a good question. What does getting paid look like for freelance? Do they pay a percentage up front, then final when it's done? Do you send a square up uh, invoice? Uh, do the damn webinar? I'm doing the webinar. Oh, I guess this isn't really a webinar. This is kind of like a QA. and a um, So getting paid uh, when you're a freelancer could look like whatever it is you want as a freelancer. If you're a freelancer, you're the boss. So the way I do it is for web design, I break it up into steps because usually it's for a decent amount of money so I don't want to say like, okay, you just got to pay me all of it right now, dude, or do that or whatever. I call everybody dude. Um, so the way that I do it is I make it incremental. So to work with me and to get in my calendar, you need to put a down payment down. Pretty standard stuff. It's usually not that much. It's usually like 500 or 1,000 bucks. It's not that much of the project. And then I make every milestone where I give the client something a milestone where they then in turn give me money. So if it's a website, then when I give them mock-ups, they give me money. When I give them a beta site, they give me money. When it's ready to launch, then they give me money. So it's kind of broken up in pieces. Um, I don't know what Square Up is. Maybe that's that... Um, that little square dongle that sits on your iPhone. I don't know, you can invoice them however you want. I use Plaza, which Drew Wilson built, which is pretty awesome, and that connects to my Stripe account, which then connects to my bank account. People send me checks still, the my old school clients who, it sucks to have to go to a bank, but I appreciate their old schoolness, so I'm not gonna complain. But yeah, you can invoice however you want, and you can bill however you want. I suggest getting money at least some of it before you're giving them something because you're putting yourself out there by doing the work. They're to put themselves out there by ponying up some money. Um, here's one that I haven't answered. Oh boy. I teach university web design and development classes. Good for you. When I started doing this, there were no design and development classes for the web because this was back in the 90s because I'm a lot older than a lot of people think I am. So good for you for teaching that. Uh, that's pretty cool. If you could tell my students one thing about the profession, what would it be? I think that the design and development aspect of it is kind of important, but the being able to communicate with other people is more important. I think the reason why I have had, I guess, the successes that I've had and the reason why I'm booked in advance all the time is because I'm good at 
communicating with people, not necessarily like in videos. I know I'm super awkward in doing this, but I'm good at getting my point across and trying to listen as much as I can to what they have to say and the problems that they're having with with what they're having with the website I mean that they're coming to me for a reason right so it's more important that I understand what they need to do to fix that and propose what they need to do to fix it than the actual design and development so listening skills and communication skills I think are important because a lot of times especially if you're doing it for freelance you kinda wanna be thought of as and I think it was Ramit Sethi that 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 I first read about this and it makes sense is that there's kinda two kinds of people that do um, work as a service for for the clients that they serve so there's like technicians who do work and get paid by the hour to do it and you can go on Fiverr and find people for five bucks to do pretty much anything it's kinda scary what people will do for five dollars it's also kinda cool I love Fiverr um, or you can go on Elance or that sort of thing or so those are the technicians and you can be a technician that's getting paid two hundred dollars an hour but there, you still run the risk of being underbid somewhere and at that point with technicians it's just kind of about money whereas if you become like the visionary it's such a stupid word like Ramit says it and owns it I can't own the word visionary I think it's kinda of silly but I, I don't have a better word so I'm gonna say visionary and kinda of be like oh, when I say it so or you could be visionary and that's somebody that gets paid for because they are them and they're the only person that can solve that problem and they bring a unique skill set to the table even if they have the same technical skills they have the knowledge to be able to solve the problems they're the problem solvers as opposed to just somebody that says like yes I'll do this project here's the project done where a visionary would be like these are the prob bring me your problems I will pitch you good solutions and then I will take those solutions and build something from that so I guess that is my advice to college students, um, even though I dropped out of university. Um, let's do one more. It is 1.56 my time. So I'm going to find one more question. Um, let's select this one, Vera. It's an easy one to close it off. I'm a WordPress fan. Do you consider it the most popular platform, or are there others that are easier to work with? Well, Vera, I think it is the most popular platform as far as content management systems go. Um, I'm also a fan. Shameless plug, I got interviewed. If you go to the Jetpack website, which is a plugin for WordPress, there's an interview of me as the latest blog post, which I thought was kind of cool. I like that. Um, such a nerd. I was so stoked to be interviewed by Jetpack. But there might be easier platforms to work with. I think if you're a developer, it also comes down to what you're comfortable with and comes down to the projects in the past that you've done. Have your clients been contacting you every three seconds because they don't know how to do something? Then maybe WordPress isn't the best thing. Like I don't think WordPress is the best for anything and everything under the sun. For blogs and content, it's awesome. and I like it and I use it for everything but my own websites, like I said. Well, I think that's it. Uh, I feel like I'm done, and I hope that everybody enjoyed watching my uh, weird and quirky movements and speech patterns, and I hope that I answered a lot of your questions, and I hope that you had as much fun as I did, because even though this was difficult for me and I was scared of doing this, I actually enjoyed doing this. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to sign off. Uh, if if you have any more questions, hit me up on Twitter, PJRVS. Um, and if you're not on my mailing list, you can sign up at pjrvs.com slash sign up and listen to me write about things that I think are important to you. And I hope that they are. Cheers.